from a borderland. How we're doing this? Many exhibits, programs, events. I'd like to give you examples like we have great reenactments of Password and the Real Old West. Some fundraisers like Polorial eat the exhibit which help us to raise money for the conservation fund of this later mission dog. Also recently we received a very prestigious national award for our exhibit neighborhoods and shared memories which is behind me, if you haven't seen it, it is a massive, this is an exhibit with outstanding design awarded by the reputable organization of AIGA, which stands for Communication Designers Professionals. This is summary of the museum, I can talk about the museum, but it's not about the museum, that's about me. It is about our collaboration with the Tom Lee Institute, and we're very fortunate to work with the Tom Lee Institute this is our third year in a row. This afternoon we are going to have a very special lecture on the Santa Rita Ballwell and the history of the University of Formentan. It's going to be presented by Mr. Paul Foster and also we have a very special addition to the lecture. The original of the Santa Rita Ballwell is called uh, Riches in Desolation, 1941. <coughs> It is a Tony drawing, and we're going to have it just for this lecture. This is from the collection of Mr. Jack Hardwell, and it was a gift by a representative Dean Marvel to Jack Hardwell's collection. So please make sure you uh, see this original artwork. It's here only for a few hours. Now uh, it is my pleasure to introduce with Mr. Paul Foster, who is the private sector impetus for the redevelopment of downtown El Paso. Also, uh, downtown El Paso, I would like to mention a few fascinating projects, including his work on San Jacinto Plaza with the city, with the city of El Paso, also the Mills Building, and of course, his enormous contribution to the Paul Foster School of Medicine. Thank you so much for making El Paso a better place to live. Um, Paul Foster is the founder of Western Refinery and he's been the chair of the board since September 2005. Also, he's on the board of the University of Texas System, of, uh, system Board of the Region since 2007. Uh, and currently, he's the vice chairman. Also, he's on the board of West Star Bank. He's the chair of the board of the Texas Investment Management Group, and he's engaged in so many wonderful civic and professional organizations. Before I give my to Paul Foster, I'd like to recognize the presence of our state representative, Dean Margo. Thank you for coming. And, <laughs> and also, uh, Tom, from Tom Lee Institute, the founder and the president of the Tom Lee Institute, Adair Margo, and I am not sure if there are more members of the board, but again, on behalf of our museum and our department, Museums and Culture, Creative Culture Affairs Department, thank you so much for collaborating with us. It is so important that we bring the wonderful legacy of Tom Lee. And now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one of El Paso's greatest businessmen and philanthropists, Paul Foster. Thank you, Julia. Uh, as I'm sure you all already know, we're very fortunate to have Julia in our community. Uh, she does an amazing job with the museum. And uh, I was talking a little earlier, I, the thing that she lacks is, is enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see if I, uh -oh, are we still going? Is this is there, is yeah. there, okay. Um, first of all, I just want to say, you know, it's a pleasure to be here and it's, it's an honor. I appreciate it there, uh, inviting me to do this and to ask me to talk about two of my favorite topics. One is oil and the other is the University of Texas. Um, and as my wife would tell you, I like talking about both of these subjects, uh, so much so that sometimes she sort of tunes me out. So feel free to do the same. I'm, I'm accustomed to it. <clears throat> uh, I love Tom Lee's painting, Riches and Desolation. Um, 
Actually, anytime I see black liquid, black liquid I, I think it's beautiful. Uh, and of course, you would expect me to say that, but the truth is the black liquid in, in Tom's painting represents three important things the world over. Energy, money, and our environment. And, and, he, and he captured all of us here. In that context, Tom Lee's painting depicts much more than the 1923 desolation of Texan, Texas, which is where this, this, well, this uh, well was drilled. And it helps us realize that he saw much more through his own eyes than the stark black ugliness of early oil production. He recognized that this was something very important for, for Texas and for the Southwest, and in fact, very important for the future of the world. What this painting depicts is the first major oil discovery in Texas, a discovery that began the exploration and development of the Permian Basin and at the same time became the first significant endowment to the Permanent University Fund. Today, almost 90 years later, after that well hit, both the Permian Basin and the, the POP, or the Permanent University Fund, are still going strong, with the latter continuing to help finance the state's educational systems, the University of Texas system and the, and the Texas A&M University system. This well is a very interesting and colorful history, and I won't go into all the detail, but the oil well, is, it's called the Santa Rita No. 1. It was named after St. Rita of Cassia, the patron saint of the impossible. And that's an appropriate name since the guy that, that commissioned it and, and originally funded it, a guy named Frank Pickerel, had absolutely no experience in the oil business, and he just decided to take a flyer and, and do this. He was from El Paso. And he had a partner named Hyman Krupp, and the two of them formed a company called the Texan Oil and Land Company. And they hired a driller named Carl Cromwell. And Carl and his family moved to the site in Texan and started drilling the well. And drilling the well back then was a little different than it is today. Um, in 1922, just hours before the drilling permit was set to expire, they started drilling. And they, they began work on the Santa Rita number one. It was in Reagan County, and it was on land owned by the University of Texas. They used an old cable tool rig, and they drilled for a little over a year and nine months before anything happened. They averaged less than five feet per day. And after 646 days of drilling, on May 28, 1923, the Santa Rita blew. Just like you see in the movies, the oil well brushed it and sprayed oil high in the air and covered a 250-yard area around the site. And I think you can see that's, that's part of what, what he's depicted here. And thankfully, the EPA wasn't invented yet. Fortunately, that type of spewing doesn't happen anymore. But Tom painted what he felt at the time, and I think when we can agree that he captured the themes of riches and desolation, desolation in a way that only he could. Five years after the Santa Rita came in, Cromwell was responsible for drilling the world's deepest well at that time, also on university land at 8,525 feet. In 1928, he formed Cromwell Airlines. So I don't think he felt desolate for too long. He, he went on to, to do a lot of great things. But if he wanted a real challenge, he should have tried to buy a AAA baseball team. <laughs> The Santa Rita continued production for almost 67 years, and in 1990 was finally plugged. Some of you may know that in 1940, the Texas State Historical Association moved the original Saint Rita, Santa Rita rig from Texan to the campus of the University of Texas in Austin, where it still sits. <clears throat> in regard to higher education in Texas, the importance of this well, the Santa Rita, plus now thousands of other wells on land owned by the University of Texas, is tied to significant endowments to the, public, to the Permanent University Fund, or the PUC. The oil and gas royalties from these wells began the major contributions to the PUC, and over time has made the University of Texas one of the best endowed universities in the nation, and in fact, the best endowed public university in the nation. 
Some people think the Santa Rita's royalty started the Permian University Fund, but the Pub was actually started back in 1876 as part of the Constitution of the State of Texas. The University of Texas system was created at the same time, with UT Austin and Texas A&M under its governance. The Pub initially had large holdings of land owned by UT Austin, plus a million acres of additional land provided by the state. Interestingly though, back then, most of the revenue generated was from grazing rights until the Santa Rita struck oil. The Pup is what is known as a sovereign wealth fund, a state-owned investment fund composed of various types of financial assets such as, such as stocks, bonds, property, etc. The sole purpose of the Pup is to, is to fund public higher education in Texas. Today, the Puff assets deliver proceeds through oil, gas, sulfur, water royalties, rentals, mineral leases, and gains on a multitude of other investments. And every two, and, and ultimately every every year, two thirds of these proceeds go to the University of Texas system, and one third go to the Texas A&M University system. Collectively, these two university systems have approximately 50 percent of the state's university students. The University of Texas system alone teaches two teaches two thirds of all medical profession students in the state and enrolls 200,000 students at any given time. The PUF does not provide any funding to other public universities in the state, and this has been a source of great debate and disagreement, but to change it would require changing the Constitution itself. Let me give you a little historical perspective on the PUF. In 1900, it earned about $40,000. By 1925, that's a couple of years after this oil well hit, it had increased to about $700,000 a year. By 1943, it was a million a year. Um, and in the late 50s, the Puff earned about $8.5 million and was valued at $280 million. By 1990, the Puff was valued at $3.5 billion and earned over $250 million in income. Today, the market value of the Puff, as of June 30th, was $13.1 billion. And additionally, not even included in those numbers is all is the 2.1 million acres of land and all the oil assets owned by the University of Texas in 24 Texas counties. There's no doubt that over the past 136 years, the Puff has played a very important and very large role in the success of, of, the, of the state's two largest university systems. I'll tell you a little bit about how the Puff is administered. For the state constitution, the responsibility for the fund ultimately rests with the Board of Regents of the University of Texas, which I proudly serve on as vice chairman. In 1996, the board created a company and entered into a contract with a nonprofit corporation. They, they, they set aside and formed a separate company to manage all these assets, and it has a separate board. And this company is called the University of Texas Investment Management Company. Uh, better known as Utemco, and I serve on that board. I've been the chairman of Utemco for the past three years. <clears throat> Utemco's role is to serve as an independent investment management unit for the board, with responsibility for funds under the under the in, under the control and management of the UT Board of Regents. That includes the PUF, but it also includes numerous other funds and endowments within the UT system. Of note is that UTEMCO is the first external investment management company in the, in the nation formed by a public university with its own dedicated board. Presently, UTEMCO manages about $27 billion, including the PUF. Our sole focus at UTEMCO is investing and managing funds designated by the UT board and for the benefit of UT and a and Specific investment decisions are handled by the investment staff, and from time to time we hire outside investment managers as well. We have a staff on, on, on the payroll, about 65 investment professionals, and I can tell you from first-hand experience that they are some of the best in the world. That's a semi-brief overview of the PUF and how it's managed. I've just touched on some of the highlights to give you an idea of the importance of the PUF and, and the history that it's had with, with, with public education in Texas. At one time, the PUF was the chief source of income for the University of Texas at Austin. 
Today, HIPAA revenues account for less than 20% of the university's budgets. That's partly because costs have gone up, but it's also because the system has grown so significantly. Just the UT system has nine separate academic universities and six medical institutions, including MD Anderson, UT Southwestern, and Dallas, UT uh, Medical Branch in Houston, uh, and, and a number of others. We should all be thankful that our Texas forefathers had the vision and foresight to establish the PUF. And I think all of us can be happy that the Santa Rita was drilled on the University of Texas land. I was also asked to speak a little bit about modern drilling technology. And that's a complex and, and dynamic process, and I could spend all day on it. But I'll talk just a little bit about primarily what's going on in, in the Permian Basin. Um, I will say that, that we're in the midst, I believe, of the oil boom that, uh, that, that is, will be ever been as transformative and exciting as the boom years uh, in, in the 1900s. With all the new fracking or fracturing technologies and also the horizontal drilling technologies that have been developed, we're seeing oil discoveries in places that we never had oil before. And we're also seeing the redevelopment and rejuvenation of places like the Permian Basin. That, that were kind of written off for a while and now are, are booming like never before. Just to provide some perspective, the number of drilling rigs in the Permian Basin has risen in the, risen in the past just three years from 100 to 500. And that 500 number exceeds the peak of any oil boom that we had in the 1900s. The low point was 51 rigs operating in 1999, which was just 13 years ago. Oil production in the Permian hit a low of about 650,000 barrels a day in the late 90s. In 2011, it was 767,000. This year is 1.3 million, so it's up about 60%. Most projections have us by 2016 at about 1.9 million barrels per day. Uh, and I've seen some projections as high as 2.9 million barrels a day. In July 1983, Texas Monthly ran a lengthy article about the decline and demise of the oil business in the Permian Basin. Most people refer to it as the post-mortem for the Permian Basin. And that was maybe a little premature. Uh, today, the Permian closely resembles the oil boom times that Tom Lee so bravely depicted in his painting. I'll be happy to answer any specific questions about that, but let me close by simply saying that if Tom Lee were depicting the side of an oil well today, he would, he would not have the opportunity to depict a discovery that had oil all over the ground, all over the ground like the Santa Rita did. It doesn't happen that way anymore. The technology has changed. Oil is too valuable to spread over the ground. And uh, capture technology is far, far advanced over what it was then. But I'm glad he saw what he saw in 1940 or 41 and painted it this way. To me, it will always serve as a beautiful, beautiful reminder of what made Texas, Texas. Thank you, and Mayor, for allowing me to speak today, and I'd be happy to entertain you. He just got done doing his lecture, and now we're going to interview him. Okay. What is Tom Lee Month to you? Should El Pasoans expect from this organization? Um, Tom Tom Lee Month is um, it, it's it's an opportunity for us to stop and reflect on one of the greatest uh, artists, and his, his, he was both an artist and an historian uh, from this area that uh, painted all different kinds of, of, uh, of art and depicted all different types of life and, and, and stills as well. 
Um, and he's just somebody that uh, was here for a very long time. He's, he's recognized around the world, uh, and he's a treasure. And um, I think having Tom Lee Month just gives us the opportunity to stop and remember him and how important he is to our history. Do you think our youth could be aware of the consequences related, related to drilling? I'm sorry, ask me again. I didn't hear Do you think our youth should be aware of the consequences related to drilling? Our youth? Yes. Um, yeah, I think everybody should understand. Um, I think it's important for people to understand how energy is produced and how oil wells are drilled and, and, uh, yeah, and the positive and negative consequences of, of producing energy, um, whether it's from oil or from any other source. Uh, there are certainly, we, we need energy in this world and we couldn't survive without it, but it's not without uh, cost, both financial and uh, environmental and otherwise. And so, yeah, I think it's important for the youth to understand it uh, and to embrace it. What technology is now being used to drill oil in the El Paso region? Well, there, there's not any oil directly in the El Paso region, but uh, as I stated in my remarks earlier, uh, they're coming closer and closer to us. The, the Permian Basin uh, is, is, seems to be growing, and uh, Chevron, for one, has purchased leases or entered into leases for uh, minerals uh, in eastern El Paso County, which is something that we hadn't seen before. Uh, Exxon actually drilled a couple of wells in El Paso County back in the, I believe it was the 70s, uh, but they weren't successful. And I think though that with the new technology uh, and the new efforts to, to use fracking and other, other technologies, uh, that there's a belief that they will find oil there and that they'll be able to, uh, f to make financially viable uh, oil production facilities in, in as far east as El Paso County. Okay. 